Dr. Waymeyer has made the trip to visit us and has brought his family along and for our visitors from Syracuse and, and around the western New York, thank you again for coming. I think you're all going to enjoy the presentation. Just a couple things. I put some materials out here on the uh, table about upcoming programs and our membership program. We do have a membership organization. If you'd like to take one of those flyers and see how you could help us out, that would be great. A couple upcoming programs. Uh, I want me because I'm not quite sure of the dates, so let me just go look at them. Uh, a program called Person First Forum will take place on uh, Saturday, November 16th here in this room at 1 p.m. We're going to feature Susan Lotempio, who's going to do a program entitled Getting Around in Western New York. Uh, Susan herself has, uh, has a disability, and she's well familiar with some of the challenges that people with disabilities face, and she's going to talk about transportation issues. It'll be kind of a Q&A, an open forum. The Person First Forum is designed to give uh, folks with uh, disabilities a voice to present their, their comments and their questions and hopefully solve some issues as well. The other program which we are connected to is the movie Dys Dyslexia, the movie. It's going to take place at the University of Buffalo Student Center on uh, Tuesday, October 29th. Uh, the Museum of Disability is co-sponsoring this with the University of Buffalo, and if you're interested and in the area, we'd love you for you to attend. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce Doug Platt, our curator, and he will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Doug. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, today we have the privilege of uh, getting to hear from a distinguished scholar and author in the field of disabilities. Uh, Dr. Michael Waymeyer is at the University of Canvas, has a long string of accolades that we need to go into at the moment, but he's going to be discussing his latest book, Good Blood, Bad Blood. Uh, it's about the story of the Calcax. Uh, if there ever was an iconic family in uh, American disability history, it is uh, Martin Calcax Brood at least part of them. And um, I'm going to look at uh, uh, a topic that really cast a shadow over the entire world, not just America. Eugenics was a worldwide philosophy and phenomena that really shaped uh, the industrialized uh, view of disabilities, reinforced to a great degree uh, the medicalization of disabilities and also influenced policies of uh, immigration, still an issue today, economics, institutionalization of people with disabilities, as well as led to some interesting scientific breakthroughs that we might not know about. And in fact, eugenics is still uh, walks amongst us today, only in a slightly different form. So please welcome Dr. Michael Weimer. Um, so I feel a little like, a, I guess, a, a, a musician performing at uh, Madison Square Gardens here. Uh, we're um, you know, at, the, at the Disability History Museum, and uh, uh, it's a, a, a great opportunity. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I do have some connections with uh, uh, the Disability History Museum. Uh, uh, Dr. Jim Bowles, um, who is the CEO, of course, of uh, People, Inc., um, I was president of the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities the year that he was awarded the Hervé Wilbur uh, Award for Historic Preservation in the Field of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. So, um, and I had, uh, but, but, but my connection goes a little further back even, and it was, it, it's, uh, uh, I strive to, to collect things around the history of intellectual disability. In fact, I'm certainly, I'm not a, a historian by training, um, but I've, I've had an amateur's interest in uh, historical issues pertaining to intellectual and developmental disabilities. And as eBay emerged as a place where one could find about anything uh, online, I began filling my office at the University of Kansas with artifacts and, and books and ephemera and whatever else from the history of intellectual disability. And, over time, for a reasonable amount, amounts of money, have accumulated quite a lot. You've got to know the right search terms. But what I, I, I discovered was that I was uh, always competing and too often losing to this guy. And, the, you know, a, a few years ago, eBay quit showing who uh, you're bidding against. I guess there probably were people 
but back in the day, uh, that wasn't the case. So I kept seeing this guy, Doug at uh, people.ink. I thought, who is this guy that's beating me out of these things? And we were often the only ones bidding on these things, you know. I said, he's got deep pockets for one thing. I know that, you know. And uh, so, uh, you know, I was eventually able to Google, and, and I think we actually ended up emailing uh, and exchanging emails and introducing ourselves over a couple of things. And uh, frankly, it's kind of uh, encouraged me to back off a little bit. I don't think there's been as many things that are available uh, online as there were that first four or five years. Things still crop up. So, um, so it's, it's great to be here and, and uh, to uh, get to meet personally some of these folks and, and, and you know, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for this. So, um, about a decade ago, a, a colleague and good friend of mine, David Smith, who then was with the University of North Carolina at, at uh, uh, Greensboro, but who had a long history of Interest. He's a psychologist. I'm a psychologist and special educator by training. So again, we're not historians, but but our advocacy interest kind of kept drawing us to these issues of what life was like for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities uh, throughout history in ways of understanding what um, you know why we are where we are today, the models, the kinds of services, the, the things. So. Um, about a decade ago, a little more now, David and I decided we wanted to tell uh, what was a familiar story uh, in the American eugenics pantheon um, through a, a, an untraditional lens. Um, and, and we wanted to tell the story of the eugenics movement really from the perspective of the woman who was at the heart of um, a book that, that the Calicat family, that uh, many of you probably already know about, but I'll talk in greater depth about. Um, and this woman was known as Deborah Calicat. Um, and her story, uh, as, as Doug mentioned, became uh, Stephen Jay Gould called her story the primal myth of the American uh, eugenics movement and um, the the story as I'll try to to, to show uh, in the in the next you know 40 minutes or so really had significant influence widely across society and across the world um, and so we wanted to tell the story to tell her story for the for what really we think is the first time in full uh, because David had some information, and, and I'll go into that as we, we, we go through this, uh, so that we return her, and, and at some level to reclaim some of the dignity that, that was lost to her uh, as, as a person. And that's, that's really what compelled us to do this. Uh, so let me start then by reading uh, what is the opening paragraph of our book, Good Blood, Bad Blood, uh, but is also the uh, opening paragraph of um, the part of the opening paragraph of the Calcac family itself. The book starts, it says, one bright October day, 14 years ago, there came to the training school at Vineland a little eight-year-old girl. So began the Calcac family, psychologist Henry Herbert Goddard's 1912 best-selling pseudoscientific treatise extolling the tale of the supposedly degenerate family from New Jersey, rural New Jersey. The Calcac family, like most books in the depressingly large eugenics family genre, and there are an amazingly large number of eugenic family narratives out there, including a couple even from Kansas. So, um, The Calcac family described generations of illiterate, poor, and purportedly immoral Calicac family members who were chronically unemployed, uh, who were criminals, uh, and in general who were perceived as threats to the nation's racial hygiene. Um, the first chapter 
of the book, of the Kalkak family, introduced the pseudonymous Deborah Kalakak. And this, this is, a, the, I think, a very familiar picture from the frontispiece of the Kalakak family book, um, showing um, Deborah seated in what is uh, Goddard's uh, laboratory. You can see a few of the instruments to the right there. Uh, and we can come back, there's interesting things about this picture that, that don't really, that both serve Goddard's purposes, but also kind of make you question at the offset, you know, why is she reading a book? <laughs> you know, uh, so, um, but, um, you know, it introduces Deborah, who was an inmate at an institution for the feeble-minded, the, the Vineland Training School. Um, at which Goddard had opened a pioneering uh, psychological laboratory. So this is the sort of iconic uh, main building, Maxim Cottage. Uh, it's actually the second version of Maxim Cottage. The first burned uh, shortly before this was uh, built, and this one burned uh, shortly after Goddard left. So uh, you don't. The, the, there is a version there now in Vineland, New Jersey, that sort of, kind of looks like a brick version of this. But, but this is this is the iconic Maxim Cottage, uh, and and Goddard opened up this psychological laboratory. It was historically significant in America. It was the first psychological laboratory outside of uh, a, a university. Opened up at a at a school for the feeble-minded. This is, uh, used to be the, uh, it was built originally as the Wistar Hospital. Uh, and if you're a psychologist, you recognize the Wistar rats. It's a, a strain of rats that continue to be used in, psych, in, uh, in uh, medical experiments uh, uh, throughout time. So, so again, historically significant, Goddard himself was really uh, uh, from among the first generation of psychologists trained in America. And he and his colleagues, uh, graduated from Clark University um, in Worcester, Mass. And, um, uh, you know, many of uh, Lewis Terman and uh, many of the really pioneering psychologists came out of this same cohort uh, as did Goddard. So um, Goddard's tale about Deborah and her uh, ne'er-do-well ancestors um, uh, again, published in, in 1912, really reigned as seemingly conclusive proof of the hereditary nature of intelligence, feeble-mindedness, criminal behavior, and degeneracy for, for decades. And it was used by American eugenicists, obviously, to justify their racially and politically charged rhetoric and policies, uh, resulting in the institutionalization and, and forced sterilization of, of course, many of this nation's most vulnerable citizens. Goddard, as you probably know, derived the name Kalakak from the Greek words kalos, meaning beauty, and kakos, meaning bad. So thus, you know, it was Goddard's dramatic way of capturing the essence of the Kalakak story, one branch of which was good, the other branch of which reportedly was bad. So that, you know, that's that's our good blood, bad blood. So, um, and the story told in, in, in the Calicat story is, is simple. Uh, and given its significant influence, obviously it's pretty compelling. Uh, it begins with Deborah's admission to the violent training school when she was eight years old, as I mentioned, in the, in the late 1800s. Um, uh, Goddard says, quoting from the Calcutta, on the plea that the child did not get along well at school and might possibly be feeble-minded, Goddard wrote, she gained admission to the training school, there to begin a career which has been interesting and valuable to the institution and which has led to an investigation that cannot fail to be, to prove of great social import. Goddard had this was written. This was a book that was written for a, a lay reading audience, and uh, among the things you hear throughout the text is the um, the, the uh, very dogmatic language being used to to try to to, to make 
for the case. This was not an academic treatise that was couched in all the things that us and academics have to, you know, document and say. This was a this was a book that was written to uh, to inflame the masses, if you will. Um, so Goddard continues. He says the Vineland Training School has employed field workers as a result of weeks of residence at the training school. Weeks, whole weeks of residence. Uh, they, uh, they become acquainted with the condition of feeble-minded, of the feeble-minded. They then go out to the homes of the children, and they're asked that all the facts which are available may be furnished. So, so what, you know, what was happening was there were these field workers uh, that were being trained to go out and collect data, uh, you know, uh, demographic data from families, uh, whose, uh, whose sons and daughters lived at the Vineland Training School. Uh, much of this training of, of these field workers was happening uh, through the Eugenics Record Office. Uh, Charles Davenport, who many of you know about and we'll hear more about. Um, so, you know, to Goddard and his, and his field workers, there, there appeared to be an almost inexhaustible supply of what they believed to be degenerate family members. They were you know, you find what you're looking for, right? So they, they were just, you know, absolutely uh, uh, delighted with uh, the, uh, the amount of degeneracy they were able to find. He, he says in the book, quote, the surprise and horror of it all was that no matter where we traced them, an appalling amount of defectiveness was everywhere found. So, and of course, that's, uh, again, that's what they started out to. But one family... Uh, stood out even in this sea of uh, so-called degeneracy. Uh, he wrote, in the course of work of tracing various members of the family, our field worker occasionally found herself in the midst of a good family of the same name, which apparently was in no way related to the girl whose ancestry we were investigating. These cases became so frequent that there gradually grew the conviction that ours must be the degenerate offshoot from an older family of better stock. And of course, you know, anyone who knows anything about uh, the eugenic era knows that this notion of stock is not an incidental use. There, you know, there was there were comparisons with and, and arguments that we breed cattle for, <laughs> we breed horses for better strains. Why shouldn't we be breeding human beings for better strains? So, um, so, and, and Goddard continues writing, he says, the great-great-grandfather of Deborah, uh, his Deborah, was Martin Kallikak. That we knew, he says. We had also traced the good family back to an ancestor belonging to an older generation than this Martin Kallikak, but bearing the same name. He was the father of a large family, Deeper scrutiny into the life of Martin Kalakak Sr. enabled us to complete the story. When Martin Sr. of the good family was a boy of 15, his father died. Just before, the atta before attaining his majority, the young man joined one of the numerous military companies that were formed to protect the country at the beginning of the revolution. So we have Martin Kalakak Sr., the Revolutionary War soldier. Uh, at one of the taverns frequented by the militia, he met a feeble-minded girl by whom he became the father of a feeble-minded son. This son was given by its mother the name of the father in full, and thus has been handed down to posterity the father's name and the mother's mental capacity. This illegitimate boy was Martin Kalakak Jr., the great-great-grandfather of our Deborah. And from him have come 480 descendants. 143 of these, we have conclusive proof, were or are feeble-minded, while only 46 have been found normal. The rest are unknown or doubtful. And underscore doubtful, <laughs> underscore, we just haven't proven that the remaining, you know. He says, this is the ghastly story, again, that hyperbole around the language that he uses, the ghastly story of the descendants of Martin Kalakak Sr. from the nameless, feeble-minded girl. 
Although Martin himself paid no further attention to the girl nor her child, Goddard lectured, society has, had, had to pay the heavy price of all the evil he engendered. Now, if the Calcac story ended here, it would be just another of the nearly forgotten eugenic family narratives uh, and would have had little to say, obviously, about a heredity uh, that could not be explained by poverty. You know, there's nothing in a story like this that tells you anything about the heritable nature of intelligence or anything else. But here the tale takes a twist, and Goddard, being the psychologist that he was, recognized immediately that this was his, one of his tickets to, uh, uh, to fame and, and, uh, and, and to achieve the, the goals. And his goals, well, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so it, it distinguished it from everything that was published up to that time. He continued, he said, Martin Sr., on leaving the Revolutionary Army, straightened up and married a respectable girl of good family. Uh, and though that union, and through that union has come another line of descendants of radically different character. These now number 496 in direct descent. All of them are normal people. All of the legitimate children of Martin Sr. married into the best families in the state, the descendants of colonial governors, signers of the Declaration of Independence, soldiers, and even the founders of a great university. Indeed, in this family and its collateral branches, we find nothing but good representative citizenship, respectable citizens, men and women prominent in every phase of social life. Kalos Kakos, good blood, bad blood. So, as we look a little deeper into this story, it's important first, I think, to understand the intent, as I mentioned, of the Kalakak family and the book's impact on the eugenics movement in the U.S. Uh, and of course, what everyone in here will know and what you will see, the same pictures downstairs, is that eugenics was, uh, was a coin, a term by um, Charles Darwin's half-cousin, uh, Sir Francis Galton, which you know, there are lots of pictures, but this one is, is, is uh, of course, a painting that is the best one to pick up off the internet and use. So, uh, it's also downstairs. Um, so, you know, and, and it was, and was the so-called science of the improvement of the human race by better breeding. And, you know, if, if you look at the British eugenics movement, it largely stuck with this, this focus on improving the race by having the right kind of people, successful people, people like Galton, <laughs> to breed at greater rates, right? Um, but in America, we had to take our own spin on it, as we often do, and uh, uh, what, what really began to prevail in America was the so-called negative eugenics, the focus on keeping the people who were uh, less desirable, uh, people who were uh, termed uh, the unfit, uh, from, from reproducing. And of course, the unfit included immigrants, people with intellectual or other disabilities, people of color in general, uh, and often just poor people, you know. Um, and of course, America's most rabid eugenicists uh, were men like biologist Charles B. Davenport, uh, director of the Eugenics Record Office, and, and his assistant, uh, a, a truly despicable person, I must say, Harry Hamilton Laughlin, who uh, hails from not too far from where I live. He, he grew up in mid-Missouri, Kurtzville, Missouri, and, um, and he married a woman from Kansas. So we have our little connections here. Um, but uh, Goddard, you know, uh, Goddard worked closely with these folks. Uh, in fact, Goddard's first, one of his first publications was, was the first uh, actual publication, there's a version one and two of the Eugenic Records Office, first publications were co-authored by 
Goddard and his uh, colleague Edward Ransom Johnstone, who was the superintendent of the Bible and Training School. David Weeks was uh, um, a superintendent of a, a, a New Jersey institution for people with epilepsy. So Goddard worked closely with both of these men, and of course, what the Eugenics Record Office and 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 through Goddard's collaboration, what Goddard was was to further those eugenic. Um, uh, objectives, you know. So, um, strategies to achieve these objectives, to limit the breeding, uh, included uh, segregation through institutionalization, um, laws restricting marriage, and then increasingly through the years, the forced involuntary sterilization of people deemed unfit or unworthy. Now we haven't we haven't the time today, and, and but perhaps you know in, in the Q and A we can explore some of these issues to go into any great depth about the American eugenics movement. But but the Calcat family was intended to show that people deemed as feeble-minded were menaces to society, and that feeble-mindedness was an inherited trait, and thus justify uh, you know these eugenics uh, eugenic uh, objectives. Here's, here's Goddard writing about the woman he named, he called Deborah. Um, and he's, in, in her history, he says, quote, The difficulty began with the nameless, feeble-minded girl. She, had she been taken care of, it's not in quotes, but I would put it in quotes, <laughs> had she been taken care of, all of this trouble would have been avoided, argues Goddard. Um, being taken care of, men have segregated, obviously, or sterilized, or both. So clearly, the Calcat family was written to bolster the, uh, the and further the American eugenic movement's focus on negative eugenics. But there were a couple of other, uh, three additional purposes of the book, all of which were very self-serving to Goddard, and I think probably were as, as important to him, or most, more so than, than the actual eugenics outcomes. Uh, first, Goddard uh, coined the now familiar term moral, right? So he, he created, uh, again, the, he discovered the, this idea of, of latching on to Greek words and combining them. So moron is, is a, a version of the, the Greek word moros, M-O-R-O-S, which, uh, which means stupid, um, which, you know, the, the, the word sophomore comes from. <laughs> from the same time, you know, I have a son now who's a sophomore in college, so I'll let my wife uh, keep, you know, de decide whether <laughs> that's an apt, uh, some of the things he does, you know. So, um, so you know, this term moron was, was intended to describe the, the, the highest functioning group of people then referred to feeble-minded. There, there was this problem with nomenclature that, that, that particularly with the term feeble-minded, it had become to be used for everything. It was used to, for a specific clinical group, people who were, you know, who were the, the most capable among, you know. But it was also being used to capture the idea of, of everyone with an intellectual disability in general. So Goddard introduced this idea of moron to, to be more specific about this particular group. Um, and he intended Deborah's story as an example of the threat from people deemed as morons. Uh, these were people like Deborah who looked no different uh, than any other person, but who posed, according to eugenicists, the greatest risk to society because of that fact. So the real threat of this moron class was that you couldn't spot them. You know, they looked like everyone else. Um, here's what Goddard has to say about this in reference to Deborah. He says, quote, this is a typical illustration of the mentality of the morons. They are wayward, they get into all sorts of trouble and difficulties, sexually and otherwise. They were very keyed in on sexual issues, so uh, those eugenicists were. Um, and yet we have been accustomed to account for their defects on the basis of viciousness, environment, or ignorance. Today, he writes, if this young woman were to leave the institution, she would at once become prey to the designs of evil men or evil women and would lead a life 
that would be vicious, immoral, and criminal. There is nothing that she might not be led into because she has no power of control and all her instincts and appetites are in the direction that would lead to vice. So that was, you know, so he was, he was trying to use this book to bolster his reputation as defining this group of people. Ironically, you know, the Oxford English Dictionary, the full version, you know, that only libraries can afford and, and have shelf space to house, you know, it goes into the etymology of every word. And Deborah literally is the first, uh, you know, and it, and it defines the word and then it gives you the first known use of the term uh, in, in the English language. And Deborah's description is literally defines the term moron in the English Oxford Dictionary. So, um, so um, second, Goddard wanted to extol the virtues of the institution in which he, he, he worked and, and similar institutions which were, uh, you know, had propagated really since the mid-1800s. The first institution for people with intellectual disability, or the first school for people with intellectual disability, was opened by Irvay Wilbur in Barr, Massachusetts, in 1848. And six months later, the first public uh, school for people who, uh, with intellectual disability uh, were, was, was opened as a wing of the Perkins School, Samuel Gridley House uh, School. And you know, by this time, though, by the, the early uh, uh, 20th century. There were, you know, there was it was a it was a privilege and, and an honor for to to get one of these. Uh, communities fought over these. They were magisterial buildings. Um, it was a sor source of civic pride as well as jobs, obviously. Um, so these were growing. You know, by the early 20th century, by 1912, they had the size of the populations living these had had started to become a problem. If, as you go forward from there, that it became huge problems. You, you had people, three, four thousand people living in facilities that had been built for a thousand people. And, you know, it was awful. So, so anyway, he was he was trying to to uh, uh, sell the virtue of, of the institution. Uh, and third, he wanted to to illustrate the utility of the then newly introduced uh, Binet Simon intelligence test. Um, Goddard and his colleagues um, uh, translated from the original, this is the original uh, text that, that uh, Benet translated, and really for a decade he was America's premier mental tester. He was, he was uh, really very important in that. And so, um, um, uh, you know, he, he they, as I said, they, they translated, they published uh, <laughs> The work, in fact, the translation was done by Elizabeth Kite, who was the field worker, who collected the data for the Calicat family. And you know, there's there's a gender equity issue in this story that's every bit as compelling as the disability issue. Uh, this woman, Elizabeth Kite, had just returned from France, where she had studied in the Sorbonne, gaining a master. She was fluent in like four languages. She comes back to Philadelphia, and she can't find a job or a job that, that at least challenged her uh, because of the time and, and women's roles at the time. She happened to be good friends with Samuel Fells, who had donated the money that founded the Bible and Training School, and Fells suggested to Goddard that he hire Elizabeth Kite. Um, so she did all this translation for him. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and, and what Goddard was wanting to prove with, with the, uh, the Binet Simon was that, uh, you know, you could use this instrument to identify those people who were, quote, morons. You can't tell by looking at them, but we, you know, this measure that I'm introducing, you can find them. And he, he, he had a, a, a ten year span of trying to apply this in places we, I don't go into in this talk, but in the book some. You know, on Ellis Island, screening out immigrants, uh, you know, who had already passed through and, and, and those kinds of things. So Goddard achieved the multiple purposes uh, in the intentionally inflammatory language that I've mentioned in his narrative. Uh, but as importantly, and maybe more importantly, in the pictures that are included in the book. 
there are two types of pictures. First of all, you have pictures of Deborah at the institution. And in all of these pictures, she's well coiffed, clean, uh, dressed to the nines. Um, she's um, engaged in socially helpful and socially valued work. Sewing, she's setting tables, she's, you know. Um, so what those pictures are saying is, it's good here in the institution. This is, you know, look what we've done to her. She would be this thing that, uh, you know, that I described earlier, the moron, the, you know, the vile, you know, all sorts of problems she was trying to get into. Um, but look how, how well she's doing. Uh, and then the other class of pictures are of her ne'er-do-well ancestors. Okay? So these pictures show obviously desperately poor people in the environs of, you know, crumbling buildings and, uh, you know, things that are falling down around them. Um, and, you know, they, they uh, he uses, he, you know, he, uh, you know, this is actually the, you know, this young man with Down syndrome is actually the only person I think who had intellectual disability, if he had intellectual disability, actually pictured in the book. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's this kind of uh, thing, um, you know, and, and there's, there's, there was a, a, a flurry of activity maybe in the 1980s uh, as to whether these pictures were doctored. Um, we don't go into it in the book because it sort of came out that it turns out that they do, they, in that era of photography, it was not unusual to, you know, to darken the eyes or to, to, to kind of highlight the photography wasn't that good. Quite honestly, you want my bet? <laughs> I, I think they were made to make them look more evil. And, you know, you particularly go back to this picture of these children uh, standing on the front porch. I think it's the first picture that I showed. Uh, you know, it, it, the, it, whether it was intended or not, the doctoring of the mouths and the, and the eyes had this way of making them look evil, sort of, like, kind of look, uh, you know, possessed or something. So, so um, but anyway, so you had these, these pictures uh, of, uh, of uh, these supposed ancestors um, and the hovels in which they lived. Um, so again, good blood, bad blood. Stark, uh, different. Now, uh, you know, Doug mentioned that the impact of the Calcac family was was significant, and it, and it was. First of all, it's difficult to locate a biology or a psychology text in the years immediately following the publication of the Calcac book that does not cite the study as conclusive evidence of the hereditary nature of feeble-mindedness and, by extension, human intelligence. I mean, you just go, go and find those textbooks, and it's, it, you, you get the same charts, you get the same story. So it was picked up. I, just to, to show you one strictly from random, let's see, why am I going there? Um, the, um, the, the biology text that was used by um, uh, John Thomas Scopes, uh, the defendant in the, the Scopes Monkey Trial, was a civic biology presented in problems by George William Hunter, published, what, 1925-ish? And uh, you can turn to, uh, you know, the, that book, as it would have been used in uh, the Scopes classroom, and included a presen presentation of eugenic thought as scientific fact and an overview of the Calicac family. Um, of course, the eugenic story, the Calicac story, was uh, used regularly to uh, to justify eugenic action. So again, there are a number of books that came out in this in this kind of 1920s on sterilization and the need for sterilization, sterilization of the unfit. Every one of them include the story. Many of them begin with the story of the Calicac to justify 
uh, what they have. Um, in fact, um, I found textbooks as late as 1955 that continue to present the story as fact. This is a, a, a widely used high school biology textbook. Uh, and uh, it, it's not presenting, you know, kind of what do you think kind of things. It's presenting the same story. In, and and, it, and over the last year or two, as, as I've talked to people about this book and this story, people will say, oh, my mother remembers <laughs> being taught about this story uh, in, when she was in high school. So, so um, here's the rest of the story. Um, good blood, bad blood really reveals three things that allowed us to tell um, um, Deborah's story in its entirety for the first time. And the first thing is her name. Um, the Calicat family narrative begins with a chapter, as I showed there a moment ago, uh, that's, that's literally called the story of Deborah. And it really is the story of Deborah because it's a, it's a story that Goddard fundamentally created to serve his purposes. The, the story of Emma Wolverton, whom the world has known as Deborah Calicat, is, of course, much richer, much more complex, starting with her arrival at the Violin Training School. Emma's entry into the world was as ignoble and as anonymous as her arrival at the, at the training school that October day in 1897. She was born in 1889 into the wrenchingly poor environs of a late 19th century almshouse to a single mother who had lost her job as a domestic because of her illegitimate, quote, unmarried status pregnancy. Um, eventually, and there's, there's quite a bit of information, I'm not going to include in that, that's in the book. Eventually, uh, Emma uh, winds up at the gates of the training school with the highly suspect explanation that because she didn't get along with other children, she might be feeble-minded. The reality is that Emma's mother was forced by some socially conscious people to marry a man she was living with, and his condition upon marrying was that all the children that were not his be sent away. So she's brought to the gates of the Bible training school for this reason. Um, when she entered Vineland, according to training school records, she was average size and weight, was identified as a good listener and imitator, and is active and excitable, though not particularly affectionate. Which, given her developmental history, is hardly surprising. She was not literate at the time and could not count, but again, it's hardly surprising because it's unlikely she attended school regularly, if at all. We have no way of knowing this, but knowing where she was and, and the frequent moves, it seems unlikely that she had access to much in the way of education. But it says she was handy and could use needle, carry wood, and fill a kettle. She could do the things that you needed to do to get by, right? You, you needed to live. And the things, the skills that were important in the environment that she was in. In 1911, the year before the Calicac family was published, and I love this picture, uh, and the side on this picture, we found this in uh, the uh, archives of Arthur Estabrook, who, Arthur Estabrook is another particularly despicable Genesis, right up there with Harry Hamilton Law. Uh, his archives are in the, in, in the University of Albany, in Albany, New York, University of New York, Albany, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you had to know her real name because it's filed under miscellaneous in a letter from Emma W. So this, this picture, and it came, it was, it, was, it was Emma writing a letter to Arthur Estabrook at Christmas time. And I, I've reproduced the letter in the, in the book, but it's wishing him well and telling her, him about her escapades and trying to, to raise cats or dogs or something. She was, she was mad about animals. 
you know, and you st of the few pictures we have of her, at least two of them are her with dogs, right? She tried to raise Persian cats, and that didn't end well because they apparently proliferated at great rates. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, 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 and she basically says, I hope you come see me. You know, it's the sad story. I mean, it's a heartbreaking letter because by this time she's, she's writing and she says, I have a little surprise for you. And the surprise was this picture of her. Um, but the only friend she has to write on Christmas Day are people who were using her through eugenics and the people that were at the institution. She had no real friends or family, although, unbeknownst to her, well, I'll, I'll come back to that, she had a half-sister who lived in the institution with her that she never knew. Um, so, um, here, you know, it, 22-year-old Emma Wolverton was described in institutional records as skillful and hard worker who lacked confidence in herself. She continued to excel in woodworking and dressmaking. The records indicate that across the years of her confinement at the training school, she made considerable progress in multiple areas of life. She furthered the needlework skills and became a handy carpenter. She was an avid participant in the life of the institution. And like many people who were more capable who lived in these, she took over roles that should, you know, that were should have been paid roles. So she, uh, and in, in both institutions she lived in, she served as the nanny to the institution superintendent's children. That's how trusted she was. Um, but um, she accompanied younger children on outings. We ran across this postcard, and I said, by God, that's Emma right there. There she is. So there she is. She's supervising these much younger children uh, around on this wagon ride. Um, uh, she uh, was involved in plays. In fact, she, that really became her passion, were these plays that would be put on. And she, was, she became the stage manager, the producer. She, you know, she would do costumes. Here's her as Frau Sauerkraut in something, uh, you know. Um, she learned uh, to play the cornet. Um, and she played uh, with both the, the girls, quote, band, um, and you can see her there with the cornet uh, on the right there, as well as in the, uh, there she is, in the, uh, the mixed band. Um, and then in 1925, uh, in, I'm sorry, in 1914, at the age of 25, Emma was transferred to the women's institution across the street, uh, which very specifically was intended to provide a custodial situation in which feeble-minded women could be placed to keep them from folk propagating their kind. She moved from a private, violent training school was a private institution, um, and it tended to want younger children, although the, 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 the most famous person who lived, Deborah, Emma, may have been in the long run the most famous person, but in the 1930s when novelist Pearl Buck was looking for a home for her daughter who had fetal ketonuria, uh, she searches and she can go to the best places. This is a woman who has resources and power. And she interviews uh, Edward Ransom Johnstone and her daughter Carol goes to the Vitamin Training School. Now, you know, um, Pearl Buck had resources that other family members don't, so they, they actually built uh, Carol Buck a, uh, uh, her own cottage. So she had her own little house, and I, I have no doubt that her time there was different than, <laughs> than Emma's time there. Um, so she's moved across the street to this, this place, and it, it, it's a devastating thing for her, her home. She's leaving her home. Um, now, in the mid-1980s, my, my co-author, Dave Smith, uh, got intrigued from, I think, an undergraduate psychology course that, that recounted some of the Calicat family story. And he decided to travel to Vineland, New Jersey, to see if he could find any of these people that were talked about in this book. Um, so, in addition to her name, and he chose not to reveal her name in any of these, there were still people around, as you'll see, 
who would have known her, would have been related to her, didn't want to do anything. And, you know, the, the, we felt like at this time, you know, there's there's a there's something about your name that's associated with dignity. You know? uh, if somebody forgets your name, you're embarrassed, right? I mean, your name is you to some degree. And we felt it was the time to tell her name because in, in a way that could uh, uh, return, you know, to some degree. Her dignity. But in the in the 80s, my colleague Dave went to Biden. And uh, what he found really showed that, as you might guess, what Goddard was doing was, you know, was, was colored by what his what he wanted to find. He, he found what he wanted to find, he interpreted these data in the ways they wanted to interpret. The same thing happened with the Jukes family. Once the the, the actual records of the Jukes family were unearthed. These were just run-of-the-mill rural folks who, who often didn't have a lot of money, but, you know, no different than many of our ancestors. Um, so what, what David, you know, the bulk of the narrative, so here's, you know, this is the, the you see this in, you know, this was something that the Eugenics Record Office and, and Goddard and them created was this way of flow charting these things and so you know all these you know all these things you know feeble-minded epileptic alcoholic they've all got symbols for everything in these so um, you know the bulk of the narrative are of the Calcat family are descriptions of these ancestors of his of, of, of Emma's importantly and starting with uh, Martin Calcat Jr. who was the uh, offspring of the, the uh, ill-advised dalliance with the feeble-minded barmaid. Um, so, you know, what you begin looking at, it, first of all, let's start with Martin Calicat Jr., who was the great-great-grandfather of Deborah, who, of course, is the fulcrum of the Calicat area. Um, Goddard, uh, Goddard calls Martin Jr., the old whore, which is why that one picture had him with horns. The old whore who's always unwashed and drunk. He, he has narrative talking about, you know, he, he, he'd sell his vote, he, you know, he, he was, uh, he was uh, a, uh, a real narrative. In reality, though, Martin Jr., whose real name is John Wolverton, appears to have been, you know, really pretty successful for the, for the time. He owned land for most of his adult life. These, these folks lived in Hunterdon County in New Jersey, so the Pine Barrens is what that area is called now. Um, and it's rural, and it's poor, <laughs> but, you know, agriculture based. Uh, and, and when he died, he left a hundred bucks, which wasn't, you know, a small amount of money for that time, uh, to his family. Um, or Martin Jr.'s fourth child. This is Old Sal, who Gardner described as feeble-minded marrying a feeble-minded man and is having two feeble-minded children who likewise married feeble-minded wives and had large families of defective children. So there's Old Sal, not a history you want to have hung up. Old Sal was in fact Catherine Ann Wolverton, uh, born in December 1811. There's not, not much known about her. We know that she was married for a long time. Um, but a family history laid by some of her descendants reveals many contradictions to Goddard's portrayal of, of her and her, you know, twice removed feeble-minded children and grandchildren, right? So um, David talked with two of her grandchildren who were still living in 1985. And a brother and sister, they were both retired school teachers living in Trenton, New Jersey. I know that doesn't make the, the case well. I'm, I'm, I'm a school teacher. Uh, no, they were school teachers. Uh, uh, one grandson moved from New Jersey to Iowa and became the treasurer of a bank. Uh, one owned a lumber company. One operated a creamery. Another grandson had moved to Wisconsin. Um, uh, a 1930 newspaper article reported that all of Catherine's sons had been soldiers in the Civil War and had served honorably and were discharged honorably. You know, these, this so-called bad side of the Calicat family, every person that David looked at, and again, we go into more depth, I can just repeat, you know, time and time again, these were folks who were 
you know, they were landowners, they were farmers, and they were poor, but so was everyone around them. Um, they lived with limited resources and really against considerable environmental odds. Um, and they were a cohesive family. You know, they, they, you know, you, you know, they lived together, they drew on one another's resources. Now, with Emma's grandfather's generation, though, the tides turned for the family, the Wolverton family, this branch of the Wolverton family. He's called Justin in uh, Goddard's narrative. Um, he was, his name was John Wolverton. There's a lot of John Wolvertons in this genealogy. Uh, so, and, and they changed the spelling of Wolverton periodically between, uh, uh, with uh, one O at the end or, or uh, two. Uh, or no, two O's at the front, sorry. So Wolverton with two O's at the front or, or one O at the, at the front. Um, you know, John Wolverton lived in rural Hunterton, New Jersey, working primarily in agricultural roles. But as was the case for many people in his generation, his family, he and his family were swept up in the turmoil of the industrial age. And by 1880, the family had had to relocate to Trenton, New Jersey. You know, very manufacturing, very industri uh, industrial. And he worked as a laborer. Um, Times were difficult. The cohesiveness of the family eroded. People were separated. They didn't have the, the extended family to support. Um, and Emma's mother's family scraped to get by. Melinda Wolverton, who's called Martha and is Emma's mother uh, in the book, uh, was born in April of 1868 when the family lived in Hunterton, but by the age of 17, as I mentioned before, she had had to move out of the family home, first of all, to begin earning money. They didn't have enough money for, you know, for the children to stay home. So she, she, she moved into a family uh, working as a domestic and um, a child care helper. Um, and Emma was born to Melinda out of wedlock in February of 1889, resulting in their discharge from, from that family and into the turmoil of very unsophisticated social, you know, social support network. Um, while Melinda was still living in the family home, so before she, she moved out in Trenton, her father was arrested and accused of sexually assaulting his 13-year-old daughter, Emma's sister. Or, sorry, Melinda's sister. So, you know, this is, this is a, fun, a family that really in one generation went very dysfunctional around the the act, actions mainly of his father. So, you know, Melinda, Emma's mother, leaves uh, to lead really a life that's marked by, by turmoil and poor decisions. She moves from one uh, circumstance to another until Emma's finally abandoned at the institution. So, really, the real story of the disfavored Calicax, the other Wolvertons, it, it's not free of troubles and, and human frailties. The, the family had its its share of skeletons in the closet, and so did most of our families, you know. Uh, genealogy is an interesting thing to do, to find out who, who, who beget you. Um, particularly if they were faced with poverty and the lack of education and scarce resources for dealing with social, you know, tumultuous times of social change. But the family also had its strengths and its successes. And the, one of the tragedies of the disfavored Calcax is that their story was distorted so as to be interpreted according to a powerful myth. And that myth, of course, was that of the Jews. This, says Goddard, this is the ghastly story of the descendants of Martin Calacac Sr. He concluded in the Calacac family from the nameless, feeble-minded girl. But, of course, it wasn't. It wasn't because Goddard's story, it was Goddard's story conducted by Goddard to fulfill the need for a eugenic narrative to fit his worldview and to bolster the eugenic myth. It was perhaps Deborah Calicat's story, but it wasn't Emma Wolverton's story. Her story was the story of many American families, people living simply in a rural setting, who for whatever reason were swept at the end of the 19th and start of the 20th century into an urban America and into a life really like many immigrants that they were 
unprepared for and was, was very difficult. And as if that wasn't enough, the third thing that we reveal is that, in fact, Goddard and Kite just flat out got the genealogy wrong. Um, in 2001, which was when we decided it's time to tell this story. In 2001, there was a, a, a family opus of the Wolverton family dating back to the immigrant time uh, uh, published. Uh, the, the author, David McDonald and Nancy McAdams, what is it, 860 pages. I have, uh, there are very many copies, I have one of them. And all of the Calicat members are there to be found, if you know what to look for. And the reason that we knew to look from there is because in the appendix to the book, McDonald and McAdams wrote about the Calicat. He says, and, and, and he introduces the story, but then he gets into the actual genealogy. He says, there should be no doubt that John Wolverton, referring to the man Goddard referred to as Martin Calicat Jr., the old horror, was a son of Gabriel Wolverton and Catherine Murph. John's parentage would not merit further comment if he had not been described in the Calicat family, a book published in 1912, as an illegitimate son of John Wolverton and an unnamed feeble-minded tavern girl. When in fact, 6.4.1 John, that's the genealogy, <laughs> you know, uh, you go six generation, whatever else, and that's Martin Jr. And 1.1.1 John, that's Martin Sr., were second cousins and both perfectly legitimate sons of their married parents. Martin Kalakak was not the illegitimate, illegitimate son of Martin. Whether the dalliance with the allegedly feeble-minded barmaid was fiction or fact, I'm betting fiction, Goddard's natural experiment never occurred. There was no Caicos, there was no Cowles, no Calicats, there was no good blood, no bad blood. One line of Wolverton's had access to resources, money, education, health care. Another line of Wolverton's had none of these, and they swept millions of Americans to the bowels of America's urban areas, into lives that were often barely livable. Emma Wolverton moved to the New Jersey State Institution for Feeble-Minded Women in July of 1914. Emma, at this time, described a social worker who worked with her, was a handsome young woman, 25 years old, with many accomplishments. She was a celebrity by the time she went to the they were, they were actually pleased to get her. And I discovered not, not too long ago, and well after the book was published, that there is still, it's a developmental center now, uh, and there is a, a, uh, a Emma Wolverton Cottage. And I'll bet you the people that work there now have no idea who Emma Wolverton was. <laughs> um, so, uh, as she had done at the training school, Emma assumed child care responsibilities for the assistant superintendent of the women's facility. For a number of years, Emma worked as a nurse's aide at the institution's on-grounds hospital. Quoting again from her support person, in the early 1920s, a mild epidemic broke out in the building for low-grade patients. Isolation was arranged, and the hospital being shorthanded at the time, Deborah was glad to assist the special nurse. She immediately mastered the details of routine treatment and was devoted to her charges. And this is not a story without problems by any means. She was not an angel. She's described time and again as willful, overbearing, and possessing what could become a very vicious temper. On the other hand, I've worked in institutions. Those are often exactly the behaviors necessary to survive and to get anything done. If you're meek, the meek do not inherit the earth in institutions for people. They, just, they get run over, they get beat up, they get, they, you know. Inconsistent with Goddard's depiction of her, Emma was literate and well read She was a passionate and committed letter writer. I've already told you about that one letter. She wrote 
Goddard all of his life and then continued to write Goddard's niece after Goddard passed away. In her final years, Emma Wolverton was offered the alternative of leaving the institution. By then, she was in intense pain because of severe arthritis. And she used a wheelchair most of the time. She declined the opportunity because she knew she needed the constant medical uh, support that she got. And she had never lived anywhere else. She says, quote, I guess after all, I'm where I belong. Emma told her support person once in 1938. Emma was hospitalized for the last year of her life, but, quote, bore the frequent intense pain most bravely and without a great deal of complaint. She died in 1978 at the age of 89 years. She had lived in an institution 81 of those years with blood I've done is I've created a Facebook page for the book, and uh, we, the, the, the publisher was very generous in, in, in putting a lot of pictures in the book itself. But I have over 100, and, you know, 150 images of around the story, so I put those online on the Facebook page as, you know, to fill out some of the things that could be published. Mike, thank you for a very thorough and interesting presentation. We'd like to open up. Uh, Open up the day to questions. If anybody have any questions uh, specific, then look to. I think it was a wonderful presentation. I learned a great deal from it, and I think it's a, a fantastic story. And you put filaments out to a great deal of very important history beyond the human drama that you talk about. Um, I want to ask you, uh, in light of the of Deborah's biography and the manifest talent, skills, and intelligence she showed, including, I think, fantastically, a long history of sending letters to the man who typified her as the, uh, you know, a, a, a terrible social problem. Is there any evidence whatsoever that um, these talents and skills and intelligence caused a man like Goddard to question? Even briefly, his the yeah. science he created. Uh, I thought you were going to ask a different question. This is this is a, a good question. Well, it's, I, it's I, not I, a profound question, I, I, and, and yet it is a profound. Well, question. Uh, you know, the, the counter to the question and the one that I I've, I've addressed some is: Do you think she had intellectual disability? To begin with, Goddard from I, I don't see Goddard questioning. I mean, it was he was convinced, you know, because of. And she clearly, you know, she, she wasn't literate as much. She, you know, there were things she couldn't do. They were just so focused on the deficit that I don't think, I, I don't recall anything. And I, I have read virtually everything that Goddard has written. Uh, and uh, he does change his mind as time goes on. And ironically, he comes back at the end of his life and says, I got it wrong. But then he, he you know, about the Calicate family? About his assumptions about the hereditary nature of feeble minded his, 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 his At the epoch of his uh, uh, kind of that hereditary thing, he, he delivered a, the Van Naxum lecture at Princeton. Very distinct. I mean, people like Hubble and Hubble. I mean, these were Nobel laureates. I mean, he was invited, and that was printed, his lecture was printed out. And that lecture suggested that we could, we could use. People like, you know, like Deborah, he didn't say Deborah, but like Deborah, there's a role for them in society. They should immediately be kind of funneled into these tracks for being maids and being this and that. So it was a very mechanistic, you know, kind of thing. But you go fast forward later on, he, he realizes, you know, as the science progresses, he just, he was just wrong about that. But, and he said that, he says, I think I've gone back to the enemy, I've gone to the enemy. But one thing he never did was quit defending uh, the Calicat story. And so uh, he published in, in Nature or Science a rebuttal of the criticism uh, about uh, 
uh, the Calicat family, even going so far as to claim, you know, one of the criticisms was that they didn't know who the feeble-minded girl was. Uh, and so he writes Elizabeth Kite. See, Doug knows all this stuff, but he's, he's dying to feel good. <laughs> he, he writes Elizabeth Kite, who has gone off, and he says, uh, we knew the name of the feeble-minded woman, right? We just, we, we chose to make her anonymous for, you know, for, because we're, you know, we're good folks. We, you mean. And, yeah. You mean and, and Elizabeth writes back and says, no, we, we had no knowledge of the name of this woman. You know, we just have this. You go to this science article, even after being told by Elizabeth Kite that they didn't know the, the identity, he claims, in defense of the Calicat story, that they knew the identity and they just tried. So he flat out lied, you know. And so, so, um, so, you know, frankly, if he had stepped up and said, you know, it was a study of its era, and you know, it, it, it's part of the progress of science, but it's no longer right, history might have treated him much more kindly than it has. So, so anyway, no, I, he never, you know. So even to the end, he was arguing uh, uh, for that. You know, there was a, along about the same time, there was a flurry of, uh, of um, articles and, and comments about uh, the, the marking up of the faces and everything on the pictures. Uh, there was a mini debate about what condition uh, Deborah might have had, you know. And there were all sorts of things, and it, it seems to have settled on FAS. She must have had a few lot of I Quite honestly, I think it's beyond speculative to assume she had intellectual disability at all, intellectual terms. She comes out of a highly dysfunctional family. She has had not a whit of education. She comes to an institution for people with intellectual disability. You know, I, my sense is given the, the strengths that she had that should have caused Goddard to question it. And, you know, and again, I think it's so funny he put a book in her hand <laughs> for that frontispiece picture, uh, um, you know, I think she probably would have done just fine in general. I don't know, you know. Well, I think that the, the real great contradiction of the Calicat story and how you've laid it out is the idea of nature and nurture. And it is a story of families. And the, the funny thing about the eugenic family studies is the pedigree, and that's why I didn't mention your pedigree. Um, I myself am a half-breed American Indian, or as uh, Esther Book and Laughlin and others would say, I'm a mongrel. Yeah, mongrel because we're not pure. Right? And they're looking for purity, and they're also looking for success. And the easiest way to get success is to have a formula. And the, the scientific hereditary nature is the easiest formula. And, again, part Indian, so... You never want to let facts get in the way of a good story. So that, that's why it was perpetuated for so long. Uh, with that, you have a um, question? Yeah, first of all, I applaud you for breaking the myth. I think it's an uh, incredible story. Um, and one observation, from a woman's point of view, it seemed like the original blame is a woman, you know? Yeah, that's um, that's the Again, there's a gender <laughs> issue. There's uh, a gender issue right, right, from from right through, through that story. And I just have two questions. First of all, for God, or when, maybe I missed the timeline, but what standard and what criteria did he use to determine for fuel minus? And secondly, and this is a little out there, but given that they were wrong about intel that that do you think that intellectual disability and diagnosing it and label it perhaps now can be said it's an invented disease or an invented thing and that we're all just like fingerprints, we're all just different? I'll start with the last one, then you'll have to remind me of the first one. Okay. Uh, the, uh, you know, I mean, intellectual disabilities are socially constructed. They, they, you know, you can have the chromosome that leads to Down syndrome and not have intellectual disability. It doesn't happen that often. But, you know, and, and virtually anything that, quote, causes intellectual disability doesn't always do that, you know. Uh, and, and, of course, you know, we, we know it's socially constructed. It's, it's based upon people who just aren't doing well in society. And one of the things I think in this era, we're in a really interesting era for people who have been labeled as having intellectual disability because the advances in technology are going to make what we can't do irrelevant by and large. Uh, you know, and I've just, uh, it's, it's becoming clearer and clearer. Uh, for example, just a, a, you know, a, a pedestrian um, 
illustration that, you know, what, one of the things that often results in difficulty in employment for people with disabilities in general, but for, and as well for people with intellectual disabilities, is transportation. You know, time and memorial, right? You, you talk to groups of people with disabilities, transportation is always right up there with the biggest problem. They can't get to where they want to go, they can't get to the job, there's no reliable, they're reliant on things that cost a lot of money and are unreliable. We will, we're a decade away from having cars that drive themselves. And we're probably two decades away from an infrastructure that will begin to support that. But, you know, we already have, and you see, you know, I, we, some, I'm sure some of you are, we already have cars that will park themselves. Uh, my wife and I were in one uh, in England, oh, yeah. in this little bitty <laughs> slot, and I was amazed. Uh, we already have cars that will break if it gets too close. It won't matter that you can't drive anymore. You will be able, and, and you know that wearable computing and the things that are happening with the internet of everything. We're getting to a point where, you know, the, the, the World Health Organization's international classification of functioning uh, and health and disability looks at, at disability, and including intellectual disability, as the gap between personal capacity and the demands of the environment. And the more you can close and, and perhaps completely close that gap, the impairment doesn't go away, but it becomes irrelevant in terms of whether you have a disability. So, uh, so I think we're heading to a point where, particularly intellectual disability, you know, we're, we're, we're going to see, you know, that it, it's just not the issue that, that it has been in the past. Now, your first question was related to... How did he know how to, how yeah, did yeah. to determine... Well, and, and he, um, um, uh, he, um, he used the, 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 the Binet-Simon scale. And, you know, this was before the notion of um, actually IQ scores. So they, they weren't scored. And, the, and but there, there were beginning to be used kind of early versions of mental age. So if you go in and, and the, you know you, you read the Calicat book, you read his things. He talks about and, and, he, and he set the standards for mental age. So it was how well you performed on, on those tests was, was, was how he he determined. It. And then so, there were other performance physical tests. We have two down in the museum. If you yeah, look yeah. At them, That'll kind of sort out you know very well by uh, Healy, okay. uh, Fernanda. Yeah. Uh, Goddard's su successor at uh, Violin was a guy named, um, well, I can't remember, but he also had this maze test. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that's going on. Same, 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 same test we used at Ellis Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right, and, and uh, you know, Goddard and his, his, his field workers went to Ellis Island and eyeballed people and, who had already passed through. They were, they were a step almost away from being in America and said, we think that person, that person, and that person is feeble-minded, and they brought them in, and they often gave them, they gave them this test. Many of them, of course, didn't speak English or didn't speak it well. And, you know, and many of those people were put back on a boat and sent right back. Um, fortunately, the, the, the uh, uh, Immigration National Services, they had their own way of doing things. They didn't really want Goddard intruding too much on them. So, it, you know, I don't think it, the, the wide use of intelligence testing in, in like Ellis Island conditions, uh, they didn't have the time for one thing. What was uh, Goddard's educational field of training? Was it in medicine? Uh, no, he was a psychologist uh, at the doctoral level. He was he would he uh, prior to um, uh, going to Clark University to study psychology, he was a teacher, and he he he, he was uh, uh, Goddard was from a Quaker family, um, and his mother was quite a famous. Um, um, uh, preacher, and she would travel all around the world. His father was gored to death by a bull early on. Uh, the, the, the best um, um, kind of, um, not kind of, uh, 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 accounting of, of Goddard in his life is, is by uh, 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 Layla. Uh, Layla Zenner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's great. I mean, that book kind of humanized Goddard. Goddard, prior to that, I think, was a very easy to cast as an evil person. You know, an evil man doing evil things. Football. 
I think it was USC's first football coach. Undefeated. Goddard. Goddard was USC's. But what, what Zetterlund's work showed was that he was a man who, you know, the, first of all, all of society was, was these things. He was, you know, he was, he, he was doing things that, you know, were, were, were not outside the accord. And he was just sort of a man of his ages. But anyway, uh, he, uh, he taught in uh, schools in Ohio and then back in, in uh, Massachusetts before he, he, he went to the, there's a, a movement called Child Study Movement. That Obviously, he was influenced because there was certainly a, the turn of the century, there was an intense heredity environment issue going on. And in fact, uh, being trained as a sociologist in you know, the Chicago School of Sociology was very important in the turn of the century. And you would think he would have been influenced by that, or even the fact that his patients were improved, which would have given the case for the environment yeah, effect. He, uh, and and uh, Davenport was a, a University of Chicago trained biologist. Mm -hmm. And by reputation, really was a, 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 an incredibly important biologist until he just went completely you know, right, uh, off the, off the window. In terms so, of the so that was where a lot of that got into Goddard's work. Well, I think a lot of what drove the eugenics movement was the fallacy of control. Yeah. That you can control human outcomes and have a better world, you know, for a better world. That, when you look at all the modern titles, they reflect upon the fact that to, disability is an aspect of just the entirety of humanity. Yeah. And that focusing on one particular aspect of any one person, I don't think anybody, any one of us would want to be defined by one trait. But this is what uh, Goddard did with Debbie Calcac. And I don't know if she had FAS, because I think I saw a filter on it sometimes. Yeah, I don't think she, I don't think she had FAS either. I think that's malarkey. Yeah. First of all, thank you for your presentation. Yeah. I'm so glad we traveled over from Well, thank you for coming up from Syracuse. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, every generation of scientists like to separate themselves from the pseudoscience of the past. <laughs> uh, but is there any uh, sort of eugenicist rhetoric that you still find or ideas associated with uh, eugenesis ideas in psychology or, or, or special education now in 2013? Yeah, that's a good question. And, uh, you know, for a while the uh, Holocaust pretty much put an end to anyone calling themselves a eugenicist. So, there for a long time. And, and now, I mean, you Google these kinds of things and my debate would ship in here as well because they probably know about, more about this than I do. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, there is a, a right-wing Nazi, neo-Nazi kind of movement that, you know, is, is very, uses the same kind of rhetoric. But, you know, I think the problem, and, and, and uh, one of the guys that, that did a, re, uh, a review for us for the book, and I think his, his quote is inside, uh, you know, we're looking for what's the big message for today from this story, other than understanding the atrocities visited upon people like Emma, what is, what is the big story? And I, you know, I honestly am not worried that we're going to have another era where people with intellectual disability are involuntarily sterilized. It's, you know, we're just past that. But you know, some of the basic beliefs of social Darwinism still exist and are widely accepted. The fact that you know, the, the, the idea that the poor have many more children and overpopulate the world, and we better do something about Malthus. Yeah, and Malthusian kinds of things. I think people in, who don't know better believe that. Um, Sir, you know, I think your book is going to, maybe it's not going to with the eugenics, but I do think it's very helpful because there are, there are they still need advocacy. So if you can help them and, and put them in a better light in well, any way that you can, it's certainly I think there's helpful. The, you know, there's a long way to go. What I hope anyone who doesn't know about this story, they're shamed into doing something positive for people with intellectual problems. But you know, the, the, the other big idea, I think, and, and uh, the Doug, uh, uh, shoot, I'm blanking on names today, but uh, Crandall, Doug Crandall, uh, who uh, is an author who has written some uh, fiction around disability stuff, but uh, uh, he said, you know, what, what this book teaches us is we have to be careful about who makes the decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think that is an ever-present issue right now. There's, you know, the amount of information about the human genome and, you know, human development and those kinds of things is, is overwhelming. That information could be used in ways 
that that you know create a different kind of type type of eugenics. Well, uh, so, uh, what do you think about the Occupy Wall Street movement and the people holding up the I'm you know ninety nine percent? I saw an image on the internet of a little Down syndrome kid. It's like I'm the eight percent because you can detect Down syndrome right. so early right. in pregnancy. Right. Um, my friend Dave Mancarman, the train, uh, director of training here, he laments the decline in the incidence of people who have microcephaly. Mm -hmm. It's like, since you can detect medically so early, that's part of the new eugenics is who is making the choice, or how the choice is presented about whether, you know, you have Dexter, or sinister, good or bad, mm -hmm. you know. Is this is it a life worth living? That's really and, and who's at the table the and who's who's presenting viewpoints. I mean, you know, there have been you know every decade there are things. The baby doe episodes where uh, you know infants with Down syndrome were basically allowed to starve to death in in, in, uh, in hospitals because because physicians believed that their quality of life wouldn't be good. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean they're not driving a Mercedes Benz? You know, and hey, in the future they can drive a Mercedes Benz. First of all, you know, <laughs> but uh, you know, who who is getting to describe the narrative? What life is like if you have an intellectual disability in our society? And and again, this issue of what will it matter when the kinds of supports that are available allow you to do the things that everyone else does anyway? Uh, so I think that is an ever-present issue. So. I think on another level of abstraction, another way of putting the point that you raised, it's a question of power, but it's also a question of authority. Who gets to speak? And how is it that they present ideas which are fundamentally shallow uh, with such authority that they're captivated? In a way, it's a question of how science is made. Um, and what Goddard was able to do, I think, was to take uh, a number of popular prejudices, common insights, uh, not look deeply into them, but rather create a vocabulary around them that masked itself as objective science. And I find that aspect of what you presented very chilling. But this presents itself everywhere around us. Um, because pseudo-knowledge so easily, in the right hands, given the right vocabulary, passes for science. Now, I'll give you a kind of example now that's very much on my mind. I, I, it may seem sort of quirky, but it's the passion now for academic assessment, right? I'm in a discipline where uh, it doesn't translate into a job, history, right, at the end of four years. Uh, I'm in a discipline where it's very hard to program the student with technical or um, uh, job skills. You can't predict what a course on, for example, church-state relations in American history that I teach is going to have four months later in making the uh, individual uh, geared for competition in society. The administration of the university, of course, knows this. What do they say to you? They say, oh, well, OK, create a rubric, right? Create a language that passes for objective evaluation, and we'll settle for that. And I think this is the same process of the making of pseudo-knowledge, right? That, that uh, takes something that fundamentally can't be proven, or can be proven wrongly, or is being driven to proof by some social exigency, and makes it into a science. And we all, I think, as academics in particular, speaking for myself, have the ability to resist this, because it's about making knowledge fundamentally. And you know, uh, Goddard, when he began really his work in 1908 or so, 1909, the science, well, he was using the best science. Now, what happened by the 1920s, the early 1920s, it was clear the science had caught up. You know, uh, Morgan Hunt and, uh, you know, the, the fruit fly stuff and, you know, the, the one unit characteristic transmission of complex characteristics was a dead idea. But by then what had taken over was the Pseudoscience and the and the people like Laughlin and Esterhaus and Davenport, who should have known better, using it for racial and you know political and other 
agenda. So, so even though, you know, by 1924, any reasonable person should have been able to reject this argument. But it was easily, it, 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 it was, was easy, easy, it was easy, easy to understand because it was reduced to bumper sticker style messages. And it, it uh, and that is a very poor description of pseudoscience, but it, 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 if, it, if the masses can understand it, it's easier to sell it. Yes. Um, just a question in terms of the, the whole nature of the story. Did Emma, from anything you've read or researched, did Emma Wolverton know she was never cow cat? Yes, she did. She did. Um, and What did she um, think about that? She was proud of it. Um, uh, you know, of course, she didn't understand the ramifications of that. Uh, but it, she liked attention, and it got her a lot of attention. And so, uh, and I, you know, I've read accounts by by folks who have, who visited the the violin training school and asked to be introduced to Deborah. Uh, you know, this is before she moved across when she moved across the street. She came with this reputation. So, in fact, she describes uh, she describes uh, she had cats all her life. You, you saw her seated with this Persian cat. Um, uh, and she tried to raise cats, and that didn't go well. Um, but uh, she, the cat she had for years, she named Henry, mm -hmm. after Goddard. And she says, he's the man what made me famous. Mm -hmm. So she knew. Mm -hmm. And she knew she was, you know, I mean, in, in one of these quotes from Helen Reyes was her social worker. And, and toward the end of her life, I mean, they would go to New York City. They would go out on these excursions. I mean, um, you know, I think her social worker had to know. <laughs> she was a very capable woman and, and described herself. But, you know, uh, you know, she says, and I, I, I use a little bit of that quote, I guess I'm, the, I'm where I belong. She sort of came to accept the fact that, that she was, you know, she, had, she was feeble-minded. Uh, she did, the rest of that quote is, uh, I'm, I'm not an idiot like the rest of these people, but, uh, you know, so she did want to distinguish herself from, from some of the, the folks who lived there who had more extensive support needs. Well, maybe, uh, maybe part of her uh, coming to terms with her state is she was now part of a family. Right? Like was she a family. was the, yeah. she's the daughter of the eugenics movement. Her home is an institution. She's a poster girl for the correct way to control the problem that's presented by people who are a little bit different. Was she sterilized? No, in fact, you know, the, one of the things that's, uh, uh, you know, sort of ironic given the linkages with the, the forced sterilization, um, Goddard claims that, steri that uh, forced sterilization was never Vineland's thing. And, and uh, to my knowledge, nobody at Vineland or uh, across the street at the, at the women's institution were sterilized. Now, if you read the rhetoric that Goddard and Johnstone and others uh, who were there use around uh, uh, the forced sterilization, it's a little hard for them to get off completely as, you know, not voluntary. But that, that didn't seem to be something that, that she had to... Uh, but, you know, the, the, the women's institution she moved into was very explicitly set up to segregate women with disabilities yeah. for life. And you know, it, you, you comments early on about gender and, and my point about gender, you know, the, I think the most telling statistic about the gender issue of this, this study is that the first involuntary sterilization uh, of somebody in an institution was 1907, Indiana. And on and off, right, on and off through the years, uh, states tried this stuff. Kansas had its, its hand at it. Uh, you know, and so there would be a state law passed, and then it was struck down, and you know, and sometimes the, the physicians at the institution would do it anyway. But between 1907 and 1927, when uh, Buck versus Bell became law of the land, the ratio of men to women sterilized was just about equal. Uh, it, it was equal. From 1927, when it became the law of the land, women were sterilized three to one uh, to men. And it, it was obvious that what, you could, what they did, and they did it at places like Lynch, uh, 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 Lynchburg, and Virginia, of course, was a hotbed. California, California was, a was the place to be. California had money behind the effort, yeah. and 
nasty people like Paul Papineau, Papineau. another nasty, nasty person. From Kansas, I would point out, though. <laughs> um, um, they, they, would, they would institutionalize people they deemed as unfit, uh, women, mm -hmm. and you could get out of the institution if you were sterilized. So, you know, and, and, you know, there are still, and I've seen, I, I, I hope and I expect you have seen some of the news, North Carolina has finally decided to, uh, you know, uh, provide restitution for people who were involuntarily sterilized in North Carolina institutions. This has been something that comes up over in each year and then is struck down because of budget abuse. They finally decided to do it. It's something like ten to 15000 per person. I mean, it's not going to be. But what I've heard time and again, and, and there were a couple of women who were interviewed on this, was many of these women had no idea they had been sterilized until they, they got married, then their husband, and then went to their doctor and said, why can't I have babies? You know, and uh, of course the Carrie Buck uh, story is the one that, that uh, the infamous uh, three generations of imbos Imbecile's comments, and yet, you know, Carrie Buck's daughter, who's the third generation, supposed third generation, she died young from some sort of uh, uh, childhood dis disease or disease or lungs or something like that. But she was like an honor student all, all her life. Do we have any other questions? I just want to say, I feel like um, right now, I feel like we're not so much driven by science, it's more like a policy. Science yeah, you know, I, I think you know, in our field, science. at least in my field, uh, policy tends to drive mm -hmm. uh, things, and the science tries to catch up. That's right. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, what happens there is that the next policy change, that's where the funding goes. So it's, yeah. it's very hard to sustain research over a long period of time on something. We've been, I've been fortunate to grab on something, issues of self-determination, that you can kind of work in about anything. So whatever the fad is, I can probably work in a, a you know, a research question on issues of self-determination. But, you know, I, I tend to agree with you. Well, thank you for presenting. Yeah, well, uh, just, just know, we, have, uh, we have copies of uh, Mike's book, both of them downstairs, if you'd like to purchase or have them signed. And we actually have copies of uh, Mike Remus's book downstairs and Dr. Gerber's book as well, as well as Tom Stern's latest book, The Historical Directory Disability Term. So thank you for coming. Please stay. Uh, have, a, have a little bit to eat. I'd encourage you to take a look around the museum. It's, that, that'll help reinforce a lot of the topics that were covered in, in, in the book and the presentation on the book. Thank you again. Thanks. Thank you.